Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Marcia, the webinar director here at Advice Chaser. Before we introduce our guest and get started, I do need to do a little bit of legal housekeeping. Advice Chaser, the host of this webinar, is not a registered investment advisor. We cannot and do not give financial advice. Today's presentation is for educational purposes only and cannot be considered advice for any person's individual situation. Advice Chaser regularly hosts informative webinars such as this one, featuring a variety of knowledgeable professionals, many of whom are licensed advisors. Any opinions, ideas, jokes, or principles expressed by presenters are their own, and however true, funny, or interesting are not endorsed by Advice Chaser. Please do not act on the information you hear today without consulting a qualified financial professional. We're thrilled to bring you this educational presentation. Attendees are muted, but we do encourage you to ask questions using the chat box. The presenter will answer those queries during or after the presentation today as appropriate. If you ask a question in the chat box, go ahead and leave your phone number as well. And if we can't get to your question during this event, we'll make sure someone reaches out to you after the presentation today. We want this experience to be as educational as possible. So again, please don't hesitate to ask for clarification or expansion of the material. Well, I'd love to introduce you to today's guests. Sorry, today's guest. Jeff Green is the president of Rightway Investments, PLLC, a registered investment advisory firm that was formed in 2013 to serve individuals and families with their investment needs. Jeff and his team revolutionize how their clients think about their retirement future and their American dream. Statistics show that there are about 310,000 financial planners in this country uh, today, which, of which 13,000 are considered an RIA firm. But only about 5,600 of those firms are an RRA only that means only 2% hold themselves to a fiduciary standard or they place their clients' interest ahead of their own. Rightway Investments PLLC is one of that 2%. And of that 2%, very few have an 18-year background in an estate planning law firm, a background in financing long-term care, including an understanding of government regulations, and have also excelled in a Fortune 500 company. And so we are pleased to have our uh, presenter, Jeff Green, here today. And I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to you, Jeff. OK, thank you very much. Hope everyone is doing well. We're going to touch on a topic today that I think is on the heart of everyone across the country. And that is during this period of uncertainty and market downturn inflation, you know, what, what are we to do? Is there anything that can be done besides, well, you just have to be patient or you're just gonna have to wait it out. And that's very frustrating because pe people aren't patient. They're, they are very concerned and waiting it out. Well, how long, how long do I wait? Am I gonna do damage to my retirement fund if I just be patient and wait it out? So there's a lot of, consternation these days, especially if it looks as if this, inf this inflationary uh, and recession period could last well into 2023. So this is something that uh, I hear an awful lot, and I'm going to give you an example. Uh, and that is, here we have Bob. He says, I've been thinking about uh, my portfolio, the portfolio that I have with you. And I have some questions. We have not reviewed my account in some time and I want to go over my fees. What am I being charged in total, including all internal fees? So there is something that you can do besides just being patient and wait it out is we got time, let's sit down and review exactly what is it costing me to have my portfolio with this particular institution? Let's, let's take a hard look at it. 
So it can be very, very confusing. There's all sorts of fees that come from you from every different angle. There's brokerage fees, there's commissions, there's trading fees. And it depends upon your portfolio. Are you uh, an active, uh, do you have an active manager? Or are you an active uh, individual where you're buying and selling a lot? Or are you passive? Depending upon your situation, you could be paying uh, a lot of fees or you could be paying uh, a very small amount of fees. It, it just depends. But I've got some examples here that we can take a look at. And so there's basically five areas of fees that can hit your portfolio. That's the advisor fee or the fee that's on top of your uh, 401k. There are sales loads, commissions. If you bought some class A shares of something, there's gonna be commissions that are gonna be on top of that. You have expense ratios. And those are your administrative fees, marketing, uh, operating the mutual funds or the account. And, and that can range uh, between 0.5 to 1.5. And you have transaction fees. If you're, if you're doing a lot of, of um, um, trading, there's gonna be transaction fees. And then there's also uh, trade commissions. If you sell out of a position, uh, the, the market maker gets a commission on the sale. And then now that you have the cash, now you go to buy something, there's another commission when, when you make a purchase. So if you have uh, an investment advisor or a stockbroker that's saying, I worked really hard for you last year, look at all the trading I did. Well, look at all the fees that you generated and where do we stand today? Let's uh, give some examples here of Bob and Lois and Fred and Michelle. You can see that they have different arrangements. Their advisor uh, fees are different. Bob's 2%, Lois is one, Fred is 3.5 and Michelle is only 0.75. Then we have the expense ratios that are inside those portfolios. And you can see they range from 1.25 to uh, 3%. Uh, only Michelle experienced uh, some mutual fund sales loads. Uh, Fred and Michelle also experienced some uh, trade uh, commissions. And so let's take a look at their $100,000 investment and how they did this past um, period. And so we can see Bob uh, got 8%, Lois did 9.5, Fred did, did 7, and Michelle did 10.5. Uh, pretty good returns, but then we got to subtract out all the fees. Well, um, Bob had 3.25% uh, in fees, and you can see Lois's fees. Fred had a lot of fees uh, that just crushed his return, and Michelle's uh, fees were pretty high as well, so that you can see there's a big difference, say, between Fred and Lois with regards to their return. Lois crushed it at $6,650 and Fred just came up with $250. So one thing that we always have to be conscious of is what is the cost of doing business in my portfolio? So what happens uh, if, if we have a downturn in the market? Let's take a look at that. So here, Bob uh, had a return of minus four. Uh, some people are saying, boy, I wish I had a minus four right now. Uh, I'm at minus 15. Mm -hmm. Lois is down two and a half. Fred's down five. Michelle's down 1.5. So if we look over to the right, we can see uh, the difference in, in the returns. Again, Lois here came out up on top. She's only down 5.35%. Uh, but here, old Fred... Uh, he's down eleven point eleven thousand seven hundred fifty dollars, eleven point seven five. So you can you can see how uh, everyone could be frustrated, but especially Fred uh, and maybe even Bob and Michelle. Like, wow, this is this is really starting to hurt. So when when an advisor or a financial planner says, "Just be patient. We're just going to have to ride this thing out." And of course, you never want to liquidate your portfolio on when the market is down because you will secure your losses. But there are things that you can do. And one of those things is evaluate how much you're actually paying in fees. And I've asked people before, why, why are you paying so much in fees? Or did you realize that you're paying so much in fees? 
And a lot of those, a lot of those answers are basically a, a, a blank look on their face and kind of like, well, I've been, I've been with old Joe for 15 years. He seems like a nice guy. And I'm sure he is a nice guy. It's just that the fees are too high. So there's things that we can do. Uh, I have a question here that is probably uh, applicable right now. What is typical for fees and um, does it does a very low fee mean you're not, you may not be getting the best type of service? Okay, that's, that's a good question. Uh, obviously you want to have as low as fees as you possibly can. However, you don't want to compromise your portfolio where you, you damage the, the potential for return. So we're going to talk about how portfolio construction is important along with evaluating our fees. Uh, if, if you have a, and I would say that you should be looking for an advisor fee uh, for sure less than 1%. And depending upon how much you have with the advisor, if it's a million or $2 million, it should be uh, 0.8 or 0.9, or maybe even less, depending. And of course, in, you have to be careful if there's a lot of trading going on, chasing returns, you're going to have excessive trading fees. Uh, and certain mutual funds also have potentially a higher expense ratio. So you need to take a look at what is being selected to be added to your portfolio and, and how expensive is holding that particular investment and is it worth it? So that's a good question, Marcia. Yeah. All right, let's move on to annuity fees. Well, this is, uh, this is one of the real big ones that I run across and I'm, I'm focused more here on variable annuities and not fixed annuities. Your fixed annuity, the, the, asset that's inside of that fixed annuity is basically run by the insurance company mirroring uh, the S&P 500. They award you a certain amount of returns based upon that, where your variable annuity can have all sorts of uh, investments inside that uh, that aren't necessarily controlled by the insurance company. So a variable annuity is basically a, uh, an equity investment, but it's inside an annuity. And so why do people have it inside an annuity? Well, there's there can be reasons. One, they may be stuck with an annuity because they started with one. However, they lo they're looking for tax deferred growth. Uh, they want to make sure that uh, there is a nice designation uh, for beneficiaries. And in some cases, even annuities can provide for uh, creditor protection. But Bob has a variable annuity and he's looking at this thing and the prospectus, this disclosure is page after page after page. And he's not going to read all this. And if he did, he's not going to understand most of it. It's, it's very intricate and it is confusing. So if a person has a variable annuity, most of the time you will find that variable annuities have pretty high fees that are inside them. So that's something, that certainly would be an area that needs to be looked at. So Bob's paying uh, a, a fee of 2% on the assets that are inside the annuity. Well, on this particular annuity, he wants uh, to have a income rider. That is, we're gonna guarantee you income for life. And that sounds really great but he's actually paying 2% for that. Well, also I want to have a guaranteed death benefit for my spouse. Well, that's, or my brother or my sister, that's another 1%. The, ex, the mortality expense fee, which is generally what you'll find inside of any type of a insurance, life insurance policy or, or an annuity where you have a, a life that the policy is built upon, you have that fee and you'll have an administrative fee. So if this past year, the, the variable annuity gave us 4%, it got all gobbled up in all of those fees, 6.4% in total fees. So he ended up uh, down 10.4%. We had a negative 4% return. So that was $10,400. 
So one of the questions that I think a person needs to ask when they're looking at variable annuities is how much is it really costing me to have this investment? So if I have a a uh, million dollars or half a million dollars in a variable annuity, and you're looking at 6%, well, you're talking $60,000 a year on a million dollars or $30,000 a year on a half a million dollars. Well, if you think about that, if I, if I have the insurance company holds this for 10 years on a half a million, that's $300,000 in fees. Well, of course they can guarantee you uh, an income for life because they're collecting all this extra money. So one needs to look really, really hard and be very careful before they purchase a variable annuity because generally the expenses are high. Not always, but it's very good to uh, take a look at that. And if you have one and you, and you analyze it or we can analyze it, someone can analyze it. You can, and if it's too high, then you make it, you might want to take a look at what would it cost me to bail out of this annuity. It could be surrender charges. Um, but again, that's something we have to take a look at. But if you take a look at the long term, it could be very expensive to hold. So do you understand all the fees and expenses uh, in these in the variable annuity charges? You need to have have your insurance guy or have your advisor break all that down. Uh, do you, <coughs> excuse me. Do you intend to stay in this annuity for a long period of time? And uh, when are you gonna when are you gonna pull the funds? So you need to take a look at exactly how you're going to use this. Also, you need to understand the the risk that's that's in the the annuity itself, the actual portfolio. Uh, is it is that are those holdings very risky? Are they too conservative? So besides looking at the insurance wrapper, you also got to take a look at the internal holdings of the annuity itself. And so we have to really take a hard look at this. And one of the things I do question is why people will place their IRA into an annuity. Remember an IRA uh, is, is tax deferred growth. So if you take uh, something that's already tax deferred and you stick it in something that's tax deferred, then you're paying a lot of extra fees for that extra tax deferred when it's already tax deferred. So you really got to drill down hard and, and look at variable annuities. And if you have one, you need to drill down hard now to make sure it's, it's giving you what you need as far as your return. So we need to reevaluate uh, our risk tolerance, just like in that variable annuity or any other portfolio. Here, Bob says, when I agreed to this portfolio, I was on board because of the potential for return. However, I guess I didn't understand how much risk I was taking to get that return. The return I made last year has been wiped out by this year. Is there anything we can do to stop the hemorrhaging of my portfolio? So often people just look at the upside, especially when people are uh, looking at, they're self-directing their 401k, they go online and they start picking and choosing various buckets and they go, oh, wow, that one's, you know, did 10%, that one did 40. So I pick all these portfolios that did, had double digit returns, you know, I'm in pretty good shape, but they didn't really look hard uh, at the risks that they were taking to get those returns. So one needs to stop and take a look at their risk tolerance and see what all is in their portfolio. And again, if the question comes up about the portfolio, the answer that a lot of people are getting, just write it out, uh, it's not the answer. You need to take some extra steps. And that is get a second opinion. Bob says, I need to get a second opinion on my portfolio. I think I can do better. Can you look at what I have? Well, is, is Bob asking his existing advisor? Well, he certainly can. But to get a second opinion, Bob maybe ought to try to connect with somebody else and get a true second opinion just to make sure that what he is doing is, is uh, solid. And he may find that there are opportunities for improvement. And if there's opportunity for, for improvement, well, 
he can certainly switch horses or he can go back to his current advisor and say, what gives here? I'm, I'm paying way too much in fees and I'm taking way too much risk. We got to fix this. So how does one evaluate a portfolio? There are many advisors that have these tools, some do not. Uh, there is what we use, what we call a portfolio MRI. So with that statement that we get from you, we can run it through our software. And then when we, when we get the response, we can see what your holdings are in your portfolio. What percentage of your portfolio do you have in cash? I had one the other day. 20% of the portfolio was in cash and he was paying one and a half percent. So I'm saying you're paying one and a half percent that to on cash. That doesn't make, that doesn't make any sense. A lot of people have an enormous amount of packed into uh, the S and P 500 area. They're missing out on opportunities in small stocks, small value, international, so they could have um, a portfolio that has a lot of cash, a lot of long-term bonds, and they're sitting uh, on the S&P 500. Well, there's an awful lot of risk in their portfolio. They are uh, lacking a lot of diversification. And that could be a good reason why they're seeing a 12, 14% downturn in the market right now. A lot of people aren't familiar with this, and it's, it's kind of complicated, but just kind of ride with me here. Harry Markowitz won the Nobel Prize for his, his theory on investment returns. Uh, he's an extremely smart man. He's still alive today. He's quite elderly, but many people are using this tool to take a look at how efficient is my portfolio? So if you take a look at this graph and you take a look at the left side where it says return uh, and the bottom, you can see risk. What he did is he wanted to take a look at the performance of a portfolio based on two things. What kind of return am I gonna get? And what is my risk? Or another fancy word for that is standard deviation, which means how often will my portfolio deviate from its expected return? And based upon the holdings, he was able to chart thousands of portfolios on this chart. And you can see those dots represent various types of portfolios. But what he, he stood, stood back and looked and he took his pencil and he drew a line on that graph. And he goes, what does this mean? Well, he realized that if you have a portfolio on that line, you have an efficient portfolio or what he ended up calling the efficient frontier. Because if you're on that line, what you're achieving is you're achieving the highest possible return with a least amount of risk. That is an efficient portfolio. If you are not on that line, if you drifted off of that line, well, then your portfolio may not be as efficient. So here's an example. You can see there's Bob, he's got questions, but then uh, we've got Fred and Lois and Michelle. Let's take a look at uh, how not getting out of the market, but just redeploying your portfolio, how it can make some changes. So Bob has an opportunity where he could redeploy his portfolio and look what he's done. He has reduced his risks substantially and he's picked up a little extra return now that's something positive that we can do right now as opposed to just wait it out well he's there's other opportunities that he can do here he can take on a little bit more risk if you want to hit you can see there he's taken on uh a little more excuse me he's taken on a, a uh, he's reduced his risk excuse me but because of the complexity of that portfolio he has picked up more return. And lastly, if he changes portfolio, he's again, he has reduced his risk and he's and he has gotten a better return. Why would Bob just sit and write it out if he has the opportunity to get a better return and reduce his risk? So it's important. Uh, the message today is get a second opinion just to make sure that what you're doing is correct. 
And if we take a look at Fred, um, Fred can do an awful lot. You can see he's with the redeployment of his portfolio, basically a better mixture of fixed and equities. He, he can reduce his risk substantially and basically keep his same return. And you can see he can, he can do the same steps that Bob did. He can, he can change the portfolio, get a better return, again, less risk. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, same for Lois. You can see that Lois has opportunities uh, and Michelle has opportunities as well. You can see that Michelle is, is the one who's probably the, the greater risk taker because she's further to the right with regards to uh, risk in her portfolio, which means she probably has a lot more equities and fewer bonds in her portfolio, where you can see Fred is much more conservative. He probably has a greater mixture of bonds and less equities. So there's no, there's no right or wrong spot, whether it's, whether it's Michelle or Bob or Lois or Fred, depending on your risk tolerance, what we want though, however, is we want to be on that line. So we want to redeploy our portfolio so that we are as efficient as we possibly can. And here's an example where Bob could choose a 50-50 portfolio, 60-40, 60% equities, 40% bonds, 75% equities and 25% bonds. Now he may, he may have, his portfolio may, look very similar to that, but however, he, he doesn't have the right mixture of asset classes. Those, that's very important for us to discuss asset classes. So uh, in this particular case, if Bob went to a 60-40 portfolio, he didn't get out of the market, he stayed in, uh, but he exchanged his portfolio for something that's more efficient. So he's reduced his, his risk and, and he's picked up return. So if he did that besides looking at his fees, well, then he's doing something positive right now as opposed to just writing it out. So an asset class is a group of financial instruments uh, that have similar characteristics and they basically behave very similar in the market place. Let's take a look at asset classes that, that we prefer to focus on. So if we take a look at US micro cap stocks, I'll be able to update uh, 2021 here not in uh, shortly, but we're looking at really a substantial long period of time. US micro cap stocks, the long-term rate of return gross of fees is over 10%. You have, do you have that in your portfolio? Well, I don't know. Maybe, well, you should know. Of course, everyone's familiar with the S&P 500. There's your 11.8%. Now, of course, that's, that's gonna change once we get finished through what 2022. But again, we're looking at a long history of, of returns here. So we wanna have S&P 500. We want US micro cap stocks in our portfolio. What about small cap value? Look at that, 12.38%. This is long-term rates of return, gross of fees, 12.38. Do you have small cap value? And a lot of people will say, I don't even know what that is. Well, you should, you should learn about it and see if you have it in your portfolio. Large value, 14.26%. These are basically US equities. But now we take a look at international. We've got to have some international in our portfolio because we are in a global economy. What about international small? Do you have international small and international large in your portfolio? Well, I do have some international large, but I think it's just a very small fraction. What I have is I got everything bulked up into the S&P 500. Well, do you have small cap, large value? No. Well, what you're seeing here is an opportunity to create true diversification in your portfolio. Not just, well, I'm in 500 companies in the US, but different asset classes because they all act 
uh, differently. So this is true di diversification. If you can incorporate all these various asset classes in your portfolio, why not a portfolio that looks like this, that has over 24,000 holdings in 20 asset classes in 78 countries? Now we're talking diversification. And with that, what you're gonna see is you're gonna find greater safety, meaning you'll have less volatility as opposed to being in one asset class, because you're really counting on that one asset class to carry the day. In this particular case, you are globally diversified. The entire globe is going to bring the return. And you can see the percentages over there on the left as to how much we have in, in each one. Well, let me just make a quick comment uh, about this. If, if you have a portfolio that has a lot of holdings in it, and, and let's say that you chose to be 50-50, 50 meaning I want 50% equities and 50% uh, bonds or fixed, means uh, that you're a moderate investor. You don't take a whole lot of risk, uh, but you're not too conservative. If the market changes and you find yourself in a 60-40 uh, or 70-30, you're no longer a moderate investor. Your portfolio has changed. So which means that you need uh, to rebalance your portfolio. How does a person rebalance a portfolio with, that has 24,000 holdings in it? How does a person rebalance a portfolio if it has 1,500? Where do you start buying and selling and trading on your own? And how do you pick and choose? This is extremely complicated, but rebalancing your portfolio during uh, market swings is, is very critical. And that's another question you should ask is, how often am I being uh, rebalanced? Uh, sometimes it can be done too often. Sometimes it's not done at all. We did have a question here about mid cap stocks. They didn't see mention of those. Can you talk to that? That's that's a real good question. If we if we, if we go back, can we go back a slide showing the um, the various asset classes? Okay, so there's not a lot of appreciable difference between uh, small cap and large cap. Because there's not a whole lot of appreciable, uh, appreciable difference, uh, uh, we personally don't use uh, mid cap because they don't give us the diversification that we're looking for. But that's All a good right. question. Yeah. So uh, after we do an analysis, uh, Bob can say what? He can say, I can reduce my fee by one and a half percent. Well, you know, on uh, a half a million dollars, you know, that's $7,500. He takes a really hard look at his annuity and he realizes that I don't want to pay 25, uh, 250,000 or $300,000 in fees over the next 10 years. Uh, I may want to get out of this, but again, be careful because uh, how you get out uh, depends on what's going to end up you know, happening to your portfolio. You don't want to get creamed with, with heavy uh, surrender charges. And in some cases, the insurance companies, if you choose income riders, it almost acts like a annuitization. So you, you can liquidate, but that may be very difficult to do 1035. So it can ca cause a lot of tax consequences. So sometimes you can end up getting stuck in these things. So an extremely careful analysis needs to be done uh, before you jump out of an annuity. But sometimes it really pays off. <clears throat> let's see if your portfolio is efficient. Let's reduce the risk and let's, uh, let's get a higher expected rate of return. You should know based upon the design of your portfolio, what your expected rate of return is. If you don't know what your expected rate of return is, that's a good reason to seek a second opinion. If you don't know what you're paying in fees, that's a good reason to get a second opinion. So this can all can, can change your annual returns. <clears throat> Excuse me again, but you know, if you're down 12, 13% right now, like a lot of us are, 
Uh, but a lot of us are only down six or seven percent. We're still down because we're just the environment that we're in. But if you can, if you can reduce uh, the hemorrhaging to your portfolio, this is something that you can do besides just write it out. And just think about if you were to redeploy your portfolio and you saw some of those asset classes that provide higher returns, you could see a, a faster comeback when the market does start climbing out of this. So in, in summary is there are things that we can do. Uh, let's review our fees. If you have annuities, let's take a look at those annuity fees. Let's make sure that you get a second opinion. Let's get this portfolio evaluated and let's just make sure that we are rebalancing them. Those who are doing it yourself, a lot of times this is very, very challenging and very difficult. And, and I will, I admire loyalty uh, for some of those people who have been with a firm for some time, uh, feel like they just have to have to be there. Well, you don't have to be there, especially if it's impacting your portfolio. So just just go out and get a second opinion as opposed to just writing it out and being told, be patient. Mm -hmm. This was uh, probably one of the, the, the shortest uh, webinars that I have ever done, but it's very, very simple. And that is what investors can do during times of uncertainty is instead of just staying the course and being patient, take a step and get a second opinion to make sure that your fees are reasonable and that your portfolio is highly efficient. Well, we have some questions here, if you don't mind, and then we'll go ahead and uh, close this out. So we had a great question here. Just a second, let me get it up here. What is your point of view on investing in a diversified index fund, such as a low cost, say Vanguard index fund, instead of investing across different assets? Well, I think it, you can be very uh, efficient by doing that. We're looking at creating diversification. So you, you want you want to be able to do that. Vanguard can, can uh, often provide an uh, advantage because of fees. But what you have to take a look at is you have to take a look at that index fund. Let's see what's actually inside that fund. And we can actually run an MRI on that fund alone and, and see what is expected rate of return is. So the expected rate of return is long-term rate of return is, is 8% when otherwise you might, your long-term rate of return could be 11. That's something to consider. Also, you need to take a look at um, that particular fund. How long has it been around? Well, if it's just been around for five years, you may not have a long enough track record uh, to take a look at that. And maybe it has been around for a while, but you've heard the, the old saying, uh, just because it's done well in the past doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna do well in the future. So that's a very good question. And those particular things can be analyzed individually and that's something that, that we can do. All right, can you talk a little bit about uh, how to know if your portfolio is on the efficient frontier? Okay. <clears throat> well, it's uh, it's pretty hard to to do that uh, manually. There is extremely sophisticated software that what it will do is if you if you provided your your statement, and let's just say that you have stocks. Uh, and you have mutual funds, you have all sorts of stuff that's in there. Well, it'll, it'll take that particular stock and it'll put it into a particular asset class, one of those asset classes that we talked about. And there's many asset classes. So we have to organize all the holdings into the various asset classes. That way we can see what percentage of our portfolio is in uh, the S&P 500? How much do we, uh, is in international? Once we can see those, those percentages, uh, then we can see the makeup of, of your portfolio. And then that will be a, a great way to start analyzing that, if that's helpful. But it is an extremely sophisticated portfolio because for, for a person to sit down and try to do that on their own, uh, they, they just won't be able to do it. It's, 
it will just make your your head explode. Uh, <laughs> there, is, there is very sophisticated uh, software that'll do that for you. We had a really great question here. What are your thoughts on target dates in your portfolio? Okay. Well, uh, sure. We see this an awful lot with with four hundred one k's. You you're looking at a retirement. Uh, period uh, of uh, 2030 or 2035. So that's when I plan to retire. So as time goes on, the mixture of your mutual funds, your holdings will, will change. Uh, basically what it's saying is that as you get older, you need to reduce the risk in your portfolio. So uh, there's an addition to bonds or more conservative holdings uh, to get you to that point. Uh, I, I think that uh, there are some target date funds that are outstanding and some I kind of scratch my head because when I run an MRI on those, um, they, they, they don't look, they, they may look good, but they don't perform uh, as well as, as they should. And I, I think one person, one per person put it to me this way. He said, um, I'm willing to take more risk in my portfolio as I get older because I do, I do believe in capitalism and I believe in the market. And if, if historically, if we can see that we're getting basically double digit returns, then I'm willing to take uh, more risk in my portfolio. So sometimes the target date funds will take you more conservative than maybe, maybe you realize. So those can be evaluated too. Get a second opinion on your target date fund. Good question. And we're getting more questions. Keep on uh, sending those in folks and we'll take them for the next couple of minutes here. Uh, what about alternatives like real estate? What role does that play in a portfolio? Okay. Well, uh, I would say that I'd say the stock market and real estate are probably the two major wealth creation tools known to mankind. So real estate is, is very, is very broad. What does that, what does that mean? Are you going to, are you going to go out and, and buy 300 acres uh, of, of land that's, that's recreation? Are you going to buy rental property? Are you thinking of buying um, REITs, something like that? So um, if you if if you take a look at say one's home, if you bought if you bought a house in in 1990 and you take a look at it today, it's appreciated substantially. But how much how much money have you had to put in that house to keep this house going to, to, to keep it updated, new roof, new air air conditioning, remodeling, and so forth. So when you're looking at investing in real estate, you need to take a look at exactly what, what it is. Is it commercial? Uh, make sure that you're working with someone who really knows what they're doing. And uh, I think some real estate in, uh, in a portfolio is, it helps with uh, diversification. It's a little harder to uh, manage at times because it's not as liquid. So if you're if you're in a situation where you need cash or the, you have a market downturn, then you have no choice but to be patient and ride it out because you don't want to sell uh, your your real estate at a loss. So uh, I think it's something one should uh, definitely consider, but be extremely prudent when they when they take a look at real estate. So we have a couple more questions here. Um, what about focusing on individual high dividend stocks? Individual, I'm sorry? Focusing on high dividend stocks. So individual stocks, can you talk a little bit about those? Well, it, it depends on, on how you want to uh, derive income from your portfolio. Are you looking at dividend income? Is, is that supplementing your retirement uh, dollars and, and social security or pension? Uh, or do you, are you looking at on an, on an annual basis, uh, just taking a systematic distribution uh, from your portfolio? Some people say, try not to take more than, than 6%. So, and you can, and you can do both. 
Uh, there's nothing wrong with, with pursuing uh, high dividend stocks. However, if, if those high dividend stocks concentrates all into one asset class, uh, now you've lost diversification. And all of a sudden, if that asset class falls apart, not only have you lost the dividends, but you've lost the value of the portfolio, especially, mm -hmm. especially if you've had a, let's just say a focus on tech stock. Uh, right now, tech stock is, has been suffering. Back in 2000, it literally crashed. So uh, I, I think it's important to have that in your portfolio, but I wouldn't use high dividend stocks as a means to carry the day. Have some, but, but look for more diversification. All right, and then I think we'll have time for one more question yeah. here. Uh, this is a good question. So the software that uh, advisors use to evaluate portfolios, does that, if a person has a pension, um, does it change how it's evaluated? No. So okay. the, that that MRI example that that we gave you, that that uh, tool that we use, all that's going to do is take a look at at all of your holdings. Uh, it could include annuities. It can it can include precious metals such as gold, uh, mutual funds. Um, short-term, medium-term, long-term stocks, international, all of those things, but it doesn't, it doesn't incorporate your, your pension. So that's your pension, I'm, I'm presuming, is, a, is now has become a fixed income as part of your retirement. Now, if you're saying my future pension is coming from this 401k, well, then we can take a look at the holdings in the 401k. And in some cases, uh, it's, it's worth looking at your 401k. Most advisors uh, don't get too involved in that because it doesn't give them an opportunity to actually get their hands dirty with that. But still, it, it doesn't hurt to get that a second opinion because then you can go back to the administrator of the 401k and say, what about that 2035 target date fund? Or what about this? Why, why did you select these things? So be inquisitive and ask lots of questions and, and uh, in, the investors need to be awake and alive and looking at, at their portfolios because their future is dependent on it. Well, folks, that's all the time we have for questions today. I wanna thank everyone for participating and uh, what a great conversation I feel like we've had here at the end. On behalf of Advice Chaser, we want to thank our speaker for being here today and for the organizations that have made this webinar possible. Thank you so much uh, to our attendees for attending. Look for an email soon with a link to the replay of this event, and you're welcome to share that replay with friends and family. Here at Advice Chaser, we're all about helping you find a financial advisor. To, who is a great fit for your life and your financial questions. Our matching service is free to you and every one of our advisor partners has committed to offer a free initial consultation to anyone we introduce them to. Find out more by going to advicechaser.com and clicking on the link to find an advisor. Well, once again, from Advice Chaser, thank you so much for coming and we'll see you at another webinar soon. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.